Let me now formally introduce Eric Steinman. Welcome to our class, Thank Field you. Experiences in the Hudson Valley, colon, Sustaining Local Agriculture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, Eric is uh, the editor of a um, local free publication, uh, Edible Hudson Valley. Um, it's a very nice magazine that covers the whole spectrum of uh, food in the Hudson Valley. Um, and um, uh, am I correct, you're the editor mm -hmm. there? The editor. Can you tell us a bit about this magazine before we... Sure. What is its focus? Who reads it? Um, well, um, well th first off, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you guys for allowing me to sit in. Um, this is a great honor to be here. I've, I've been on Vassar campus more times than I can remember um, because my wife actually works here. And so this is my first time in official capacity being here. So thank you for allowing me through your doors. Um, getting back to your question, uh, I started Edible Hudson Valley magazine about almost a little more than five years ago. We just hit our five year anniversary. And the intention was covering food on the most basic level in the Hudson Valley and food culture. Um, when I got together with, let me actually go back a little bit further. Edible is an umbrella organization for several magazines that are throughout this country and also stretch into Canada. Um, it started in Santa Barbara um, by a couple um, named Carol and Tracy, Tracy Ryder, and they just wanted to kind of create some sort of local food map. Actually, at the time, I think it was more of a pamphlet. It was probably three to four pages profiling what was happening in Santa Barbara County. Um, they had great success locally in Santa Barbara and Ventura County in California. And they you know, got the notice of a lot of uh, larger food magazines. Because this was back in 2002, I think, or 2003. And I know that you guys probably weren't, didn't you have your eyes trained on the local food movement back in 2002 or 2003, but I will tell you that it was in the very beginning stages. It, it was nowhere near the sort of animal that you witness today. And I will tell you that at that time I was writing for a much larger uh, national magazine called Bon Appetit, which I don't know if you guys have heard of. And at that point, the discussion of local food was nil. There was no, there was no trendiness about local food. There was no, the, the idea of imagining something like, that has a vitality of the Hudson Valley or the sort of cultural cachet of Brooklyn was just not on anyone's radar. So they started this local food magazine. It got a lot of recognition. It got into Savour's top 100, I think in 2003, um, as like the top, one of the top 100 notable food movements or something going on with food, which they publish every January. And then um, Bon Appetit sent me to talk to Tracy Ryder, one of the principals of the Edible organization um, back in 2004. And so I interviewed them, Tracy, and had a great conversation and at the time, I was actually moving to the Hudson Valley, and she said, oh, well, the Hudson Valley is great. You should start our edible Hudson Valley magazine. And I said, oh, no, I, no. no. I, I mean, I didn't know this area. It didn't make sense to me. I couldn't imagine starting a local food magazine. So the conversation ended there. About three or four years later, they contacted me again and said, we're really serious about this. If you don't want to be the publisher of it, would you be willing to be the editor of this magazine? And so I mulled it over, and at that point, I had become more acquainted with what was happening here locally and saw it as pretty special and pretty singular. That's not to say that other food movements around the country are not equally as special or singular, but there was something very unique going on here, in part because of its proximity to New York City, in part because of uh, historical uh, precedents that had, were really affecting agriculture and affecting food history, and also because of some many of the problems and environmental problems. I mean, I think the fact that we have a river that really typifies the whole region, but in itself is 
either depending on you know where you're taking the, the sample from is is pretty much toxic or near toxic really impacts how we sort of view the region i mean the hudson river is like the sort of beautifying jewel of the region but it is i mean nobody eats fish from there i, I shouldn't say nobody but most people don't so i digress so i started edible hudson valley in 2009 and the intention was to tell stories about the region through food. And these would be stories about farms, these would be stories about restaurants, these would be stories about food producers, these would be stories about families and lineages that extend far back, people that have been making sausage for generations and generations. And also I wanted to tell stories about failures, things that did not, that went horribly awry or things that were just disappointing. And um, we've had a few of those stories and I find them, I don't know why, but I find them incredibly fascinating when things don't go right. Um, a story that we ran, um, I think it was about two years ago, it was about a dairy that was up in Columbia County run by this guy named Dante, and I can't remember his last name, but it was called Milk and Thistle. And they, this guy just, Kind of took it upon himself to run a sustainable organic dairy and bottle delicious milk and sell for eight dollars a bottle or it was like maybe six dollars a bottle and he just sold out every week you know ship trucked it down to brooklyn trucked it down to chelsea market in manhattan and you know for all intents and purposes he was a huge success but his business failed because the dairy industry is so incredibly difficult for more reasons than I could get into at this very moment. And he kind of shut, she shut the doors of the dairy and he kind of disappeared. And that was that. And um, we ran the story about him and I tried my best to get in touch with him and he just did not want to be a part of telling the story of the failure of this, which I think in itself is kind of interesting. So, um, I'd like to think that over the last five years and 20 issues that we've really endeavored to tell that story. And um, I think when I set out to start this magazine, what I didn't want was just a magazine that was utterly celebratory. Um, I know you guys have probably, I don't know how many of you are from the area or are at least familiar with the area, but just remind us how many are from okay. Okay. Where, where again are we from? I'm from Ardsley, New York. Ardsley, like Westchester. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also Westchester. Westchester, okay. Well, there are, because of the nature of the area, because we have the New York City metropolitan area and we have so much tourism that comes up and down through, through the valley, and we have a, a fairly prominent population density, there are a lot of magazines or publications that just totally wax rhapsodic about the area like the best you know best restaurants the best bakery the best hotels this and that and that's a whole genre it's a whole genre yeah and it, the, and the it's, regional magazine yeah and it's not it's it's certainly not reserved to this area but and i think it's fine to have those publications i did not want to be in charge of a publication like that that's not to say that i didn't want to tell stories in which I was enthusiastic or rhapsodic about certain organizations, but I didn't feel like the role of this magazine was to just be a booster for tourism. Um, so we've been telling these stories for five years and um, trying to evolve the conversation and trying to tackle difficult subjects, subjects that don't have um, necessarily they don't have a lot of resolution to them inherent. Um, I think one of the biggest issues that we've tried to tackle that you know many organizations in the area are tackling is the idea of preserving farmland and how important that is and how incredibly difficult that is in the face of development. I mean, th there's a, a, a statistic that is staggering. I had to look this up to make sure before I trotted it out in this class, but Two farms, New York State is filled with farms, and it, it was more so, you know, 60 to 80 years ago. But on average, we lose two farms in New York State each week, which is, I mean, 
if you could wrap your mind around that, that's a lot. And I did not believe it when I first read it, but then I've had it since verified. And farmland is disappearing. Farms are disappearing. Um, the median age of your average farmer, not just in New York State, but in this country, is about somewhere hovering around 57 or 58. So they're getting older. And um, as much as we kind of see stuff in media about young farmers, they are really, really a small minority. So the general farming population is getting older. They're getting to retirement age. And it's not really clear what is going to happen. I mean, there's more, there's sort of more obstacles set before the farming community than there are, than there's a lot of momentum forward. That's not to say that there isn't movement, but there, there's a hell of a lot of obstacles that people have to overcome. So that's one of the many stories we, we, we endeavor to tell. That was my long winded answer. Okay, okay. And you know, so your magazine, just to get a little more background, is it targeting residents? Is it targeting tourists? Where, where, do, where does one find your magazine? Um, well, you know, the magazine is throughout the area, down from Westchester all the way up to Albany on both sides of the river. We cover 10 counties. And as far as finding the magazine, it's I, I will tell you that, like locally, they get dropped off at Adams. I think mm -hmm. four boxes, which is about two hundred magazines, mm -hmm. and they're usually gone within a few days. Mm -hmm. So reliable places to find them, I don't know. It it depends. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're in everywhere from they're on some college campuses, they're in hospitals, they're in liquor stores, they're in restaurants, they're in natural foods markets. They're um, I mean, if you go to the website. There's a list um, divided up per county um, where they would be. As far as who we're targeting, um, I can't say that I've been incredibly methodical about that. I mean, I know to a certain degree that um, a lot of people that that um, are, are tourists or people coming up from the city that are weekenders pick up the magazine. Um, I've talked to a lot of people that. Um, that kind of are familiar with it and have a fluency with it because of that trajectory. But there's a lot of local people that are, are really enthusiastic about it. Um, and it's always great because, you know, I sometimes I'll be at an event or I'll, people will recognize me from inside the magazine and they'll stop me and ask me about it. And they're very much locals. They're sometimes second or third generation farmers. And so I think it's, there's no real target population. I think it's anyone that sets foot in the Hudson Valley, more or less. Okay. You mentioned when you uh, met the founder of the first Agile Magazine mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara, and you said you were going to Hudson Valley. You said, oh, go, go there. That's she was from here, she originally, was yeah. Okay. So okay. that's why she was so enthusiastic. So I guess I'm interested. Uh, is the Hudson Valley known to be particularly edible? Uh, you know, and what does that mean? What's its reputation? Um, again, for a class that, you know, we don't necessarily have uh, all the fine restaurants around here. We're not necessarily mm -hmm. surrounded by the farm. So just in terms of the food, before we get to the agriculture, what is this region sort of distinguished by? As far as the food, I'm yeah, or speaking of like restaurants. I guess so, or the traditions. So for instance, when I think of the Hudson Valley, I think of squash, and I think of uh, restaurants that are trying to like do, you know, uh, what's the the cookbook, you know, Hudson Valley Mediterranean, you know, mm -hmm. Italian food with squash, you know, yeah. which they don't they don't necessarily do in Italy per se. Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah. what what do when people come to this region or if they were to explore the the food of the region, what what would they encounter? Well. I think there's several levels to that. I mean, obviously, there's the level of who, who were the indigenous population mm -hmm. in the region, and are they represented now? And I can tell you that for the most part, they are. As far as food in the food world, they are not that rep well represented. As far as what the indigenous people of the area ate, and I don't think that was passed down. I think when the Dutch came through, and the Germans came through, and the British came through there was a sort of severing there of the culture. Um, that said, 
there has been a long-standing, pretty prominent Dutch influence in the area. Um, in this particular issue, there's a piece about the famed apple cider donut, which not so much this time of year, but a little more towards the fall, you can find virtually everywhere, and how it had its sort of its roots in Dutch culture. Um, so, I mean, I think culturally, the roots are very much in English, Dutch, and German. Um, I think more recently, because of the sort of influx of population, there has been more of a sort of refined or sophistication of, of the local palate. I mean, I think, you know, I've talked to people about eating out in restaurants um, here like 40 or 50 years ago, and there just really wasn't much going on. I mean, it was, it was a few steps below squash, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was just like, it was really basic fare that was probably very indistinguishable from something that you would either get in Vermont or something you would get in Maryland or something you'd get in Illinois. Um, but just to reiterate, because I think you're a Californian. I'm a Californian. And I'm a Californian. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, like, when you come to, quote, even New England, you know, mm -hmm. let's be clear, what does that mean uh, in terms of, you know, um, food and dining and, um, you know, and how this region might fit into that? That sort of, I guess, at least the tradition. Yeah, I mean, New England is very distinct, and I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't venture to say that I completely understand New England as far as their cuisine because it's it's very distinct. It's very much rooted in um, the cultural t traditions of who had settled there, as well as um, seafood and the seashore, which we don't have that here at all. Um, I can tell you that when I came here about eight years ago, it was kind of a shock to the system. I came in November and had my first winter here and couldn't from Southern California and could not believe how little there was to eat, um, basically. But I'm smiling because I remember my first broccoli when I moved here, you know, uh, coming from Santa Barbara. Yeah. Like, you know, oh, this is broccoli grown in Maine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there I is... I cried a, a little, I think, that day. <laughs> there's a big, I mean, there's a big difference. Um, that, I mean, I can tell you that I've had really great locally grown vegetables and really great locally grown apples and stuff, but there's there's quite a difference between something like a broccoli grown here and a broccoli grown, um, you know, sustainably and organically in California. And the, the cuisine, the cooking, is also very seasonally based, at least traditionally. I mean, that's one of the things here, about, yeah. about squash is that it lasts you know, for so long, so it's... Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's apples in the fall, and you get those, and those will last a while. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But... You know, I mean, the whole idea of, like, root cellars, mm -hmm. I, I had no idea. I mean, I... A root cellar? Yeah. What's that? Oh, well, I mean, it's this... It's, I mean, talk about old food traditions. It's this idea that, you know, before refrigeration is that people would dig out these root cellars, um, you know, that they, would, they, they were permanent fixtures in their basement, and they would put carrots and tubers and all kinds of stuff and keep them down in low humidity and relative cold. It would only stay around 50 degrees. It was basically like a sort of refrigeration unit mm -hmm. without electricity. And you would just kind of go down to your root cellar, you know, January, and get the carrots out and get the potatoes out and the tubers. And, mm -hmm. and um, we had done a, a whole article on people making their own root cellars, like I think the third or fourth issue. Something coming from California, I, I did not think really mm -hmm. existed, but they do. Um, but kind of getting back to your question, I think as far as dining or fine dining in the area, I think a lot changed in the 1970s in this area. I think the population changed a little bit. The Culinary Institute of America came here, which brought a lot of people to the region and people kind of hung out and established themselves in the region. There's a place, um, well, two places of, of note as far as restaurants. Um, there was one place in the 1970s called the Quilted Giraffe, which, I mean, if you hear that name now, you would never think that a place like that would ever become a success, because it just mm -hmm. sounds too, like, I don't know, too weird and hippie, which it kind of was and wasn't. But it started in New Paltz across the river 
um, by this guy named Barry Wine. And it was a huge sensation um, and really kind of changed what was thought of fine dining in, in this area. And they then, I think in the late 1970s, moved down to Midtown Manhattan and operated out of Mid Midtown Manhattan until the late 80s. And then, you know, they just they folded up the business. And then there was a place called Dupuy Canal House, which, as far as I know, is not really functioning anymore, but it, it's this great old 17th, or I'm sorry, 18th century building in High Falls, New York, that this guy started, and he started doing really what was, what was then very experimental cuisine, um, and did it for the better part of 30 or 40 years, mm -hmm. until it more or less closed about two or three years ago. And, you know, these are places that were, I mean, you, you have to think about this region was really seen as wholly unsophisticated as far as dining. And these were places that were getting reviews, like four-star reviews in the New York Times, and that was unprecedented at the time. And so I think that slowly sort of changed the look of the place and the, the sort of feel and reputation. And now it's interesting because as much as the Hudson Valley has a reputation for farms and food, not so much with wine, but more so with um, beer and spirits, you know, there's always this idea of like making the Hudson Valley the equivalent of Napa. If you guys are familiar with the Napa Valley, which is, was really made famous by the wine growing industry there. Um, and wine producing industry, but has since become a real destination for food. One of the most famous restaurants in the, or what was it once the most famous restaurant in the country, French Laundry is based there. And um, so there's this idea of like, well, when is the Hudson Valley gonna really become the Napa Valley and become this huge affluent destination for food? Mm -hmm. um, and it comes up, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you always, hear about the Hudson Valley in national press um, sort of compared to like the Hamptons. When is the Hudson Valley going to be the Hamptons? When is it going to be the Napa Valley? No, we're, I know we're throwing out a lot of place names Sorry. And, and we don't have an entirely American student. Okay. Here, so, okay. Well, if, um, if you guys, please, if you have any questions about anything yeah. I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, have you ever thought about using social media as a way to advertise to people, like to local people in the area? Because, or your magazine about like sustainable farms and things? Because like, when I posted a photo on Facebook with um, goats, I got to tell all my friends who are locals in the area that there's a farm here, Straw Creek Farm, where you can go visit, you mm -hmm. can buy cheese, you can buy peanut butter, you can buy honey, uh, it's all organic, you can go play with goats, and yeah. you can volunteer there if you're interested in farming. So I think a way to um, improve like sustainable agriculture and is through social media and just um, maybe somehow you can advertise your magazine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we we do. I mean, I will admittedly, I don't think we exploit that option nearly enough. Yeah. And some of it is just not having enough people to do that, and it would just take up all my time if I yeah. really tried to do that. We do have a Facebook page. We do have a Twitter account, yeah. um, and which is not the most active thing on the planet, admittedly. And we do have a website, and we do sponsor some events. But it is it is somewhat of our shortcoming yeah. because we don't. Because I feel like that would be a way for sustainable farms to grow stronger mm -hmm. is through um, through awareness and letting people know that this is what is happening. And Sprout Creek Farm can get more money through more sales yeah. and through. Uh, just more volunteers and can expand and maybe like distribute its goods among the city and maybe um, pay for advertisements on television mm -hmm. and um, maybe like be able to find a way to make the sustainable farms get to the people in the city of Poughkeepsie. Yes, yeah. I mean, I think Sprout Creek is a good example of, you know, I mean, they're somewhat of an endowed venture from what I understand, but they've also done a great deal of getting their cheeses beyond Poughkeepsie. Um, I mean, the last real conversation I had with them, they had they were working, I can't remember if it was with Five Points or Brooklyn Brewery, and they were doing a beer, it was a um, beer wash. With the Millhouse Brewery? 
Oh, they might be doing something with yeah. Millhouse. No, but it was with a Brooklyn brewery. It was oh. either Five Points or Brooklyn brewery. Yeah, I've heard and they were doing a beer wash cheese that was going to be exclusively in Whole Foods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, beer washed cheese. Oh yeah. What you what you do is I mean it's 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 not a, a unique thing in that um, the French would wash cheese in in um, the Rhine in wine, mm -hmm. and it sort of absorbs some of the flavors of it. It doesn't, it probably, what you're imagining is something that doesn't taste quite as good as it actually does. It might taste quite good. It tastes good, whatever we do. I mean, you gotta think about cheese is a living fermented product, mm -hmm. as beer is mm -hmm. too. So it's just, you're combining fermentation processes mm -hmm. and um, it's quite good. But no, thank you, and I, I totally agree with you, and you just hit my Achilles heel right there. <laughs> but, um, Penetrating yeah. questions yeah. from the class. I'm gonna go. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's without a doubt social media is is an ideal way to reach out to people and to promote the causes that we want to promote. Um, and it's interesting because I think it begs the question: Well, why take the time to print on you know seventy pages of magazine? And you know, I've really I've. It's an ongoing sort of conversation, an internal conversation as to what the viability is of printing a magazine. Um, when I started this magazine, it was in 2009. Well, when I decided to start it, it was in the winter of 2008. And if you remember, that was, the economy had completely collapsed. It was absolutely the wrong time to start a magazine. And it was at a point when people were saying, Magazines are dead. Publishing is dead. Just start a website. And so it was completely antithetical to what was going on. And, but I, I really did believe that people have an appreciation for the tactile quality of holding a magazine and having that intimacy. And I don't know whether it's just like me because I'm an old guy or like the people I talk to, but I think I've talked to people that are both young and old that really appreciate this form. Um, that said, I think we could do this form and many other forms in addition. It's just manpower. If you want to volunteer all your time, I will bring you on. <laughs> but it, it is, it's, um, it's an endeavor. I think uh, the cool thing about having like a physical magazine though is that you know when you're at the store and you see the cover and you want to physically pick it up and then you can peruse it while you're like in line, whereas you kind of have to click through different links mm -hmm. on websites. Yeah. It is, it's, it's a lot more accessible, it's faster, um, but I feel like... But I think like people check their Facebook like every day. And yeah. it's just something yeah. that connects you to the world. And I just think like being, people are just on the computer and it's so much more um, just efficient that way to like... I'm not just that. <laughs> what I'm saying is I think like, I think this is a great form and it's one of the only types of magazines that I think can still stay alive because food is so much about pictures. Yeah, and it's about the visual. Yeah. And it's like being able to see this like great, good looking food, it makes you hungry and then you want to read more about it and just perusing it. And you, you put it in the perfect places, you know, hospitals and mm -hmm. grocery stores where people like, I think I think that's part of the charm of it too. And then being able to put it in your car and like have it while you wait instead yeah. of on your phone. I think there's like, I think this is definitely important to have. Like, the physical copy of it is really important too. Oh, great, I appreciate that. And there's a, you know, again, a, an, I don't know if it's anything in publishing is totally thriving, but that whole genre of food and cooking magazines from Bon Appetit and yeah. Savour and stuff like that, where you know the photography is really prominent, you know, recipes. It's a it's a destination kind of uh, publication in a way that like, I think your general news and you know entertainment magazines, whether they're Time magazine or People or some people are wondering, do I really, am I getting any value out of this? But you know, it's well, it's also it's amazing too because of the conversations about food and the sort of as much as I hate using this word, the sort of hipness of food um, has really grown exponentially. Um, I mean, when I started writing about food like a dozen years ago. Um, it was really, it was kind of old and stodgy. I mean, I, as, much, as excited as I was about food at the time and fine dining and, and international cuisine, um, 
I mean, I could tell you, I was in editorial meetings with like really powerful um, editorial heads of magazines and saying things like, why don't we do something about sustainable agriculture? Or why don't we do something about local foods? And they were like, no one wants to read that. And I mean, you could say maybe at that time no one did, or maybe they were misjudging their audience, but it was ca kind of categorically shot down. They were like, people want to read about local food if you're going to Tuscany and talking about local food in Tuscany. No one wants to know about local food in, in the United States. This was, you know, a dozen years ago. And that conversation has changed. I mean, the food issue of the New York Times Sunday Magazine came out on this past weekend. And there were stories in there that were just inconceivable 12 years ago as having like any sort of audience other than a few like niche geeks that like, you know, weird small batch brooms and stuff like that. Um, so the conversation has really evolved and whenever you have something that evolves or something that becomes hip, you have different factions of it and people are into it because of what I've termed as food porn, which is just like looking at really awesome, cool pictures of food. Or there's the sort of like the daredevil aspect of it where people want to go and f seek out like the weirdest food. There, there was a guy that I knew named Eddie Lin who um, had a website I'm forgetting, but his whole thing, and he was, he's a good guy, but his whole thing was like going and eating the most disgusting things imaginable, you know, and he did it up around LA a lot, but he would travel around. And it was this sort of like macho daredevil aspect of food. And I, I'm not going to sort of belittle any of these because I think they all add to a larger conversation in which we are talking about food on a sort of historical level, on a romantic level, on a sensory level, and also on a level of how it impacts kind of everything that we do. I mean, there's very few things that we do three times a day other than, you know, eat or go to the bathroom, maybe more so. But we don't, we don't print magazines about that. <laughs> At least I don't think there's so. There's a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's my next venture. Um, but, you know, we eat three times a day. And, you know, as much as, you know, people are sounding the alarm that people are eating worse, you know, there's an obesity spike, and, and that, um, you know, processed food is on the rise, we're still talking a lot more about food than we ever have in, in a sort of combined communal way. And I, I, I mean, I find it interesting, if not optimistic. Can we just um, ask a, a something, you know, now that there is increasing sort of cultural connection, not, not just with food, but with sort of the agriculture and the production behind it. Um, getting to the Hudson Valley region, we hear now a lot of interest in the ways that people can connect directly to farm. And so, I mean, like the two things that I've heard associated in the Hudson Valley are farm to table and then agritourism. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about these? I mean, let's start with farm to table. What, what does that mean, at least to you? Um, and, and what is it? What does it look like? What, what, are, what does it involve? Um, I think, you know, as far as a base definition, farm to table is this idea that whatever you're eating, whether it's in, in your home or it's in a restaurant setting, has had some sort of direct chartable path from the farm in which it came, whether it's meat, whether it's vegetables. And it was a term that, I don't, I don't actually know who coined it, um, but it kind of came about probably about 10 years ago. At this point, I feel like it's a term that's more of a marketing term than anything. Um, and a lot of people dispute the sort of validity of the term. I mean, it's like saying something is natural. Um, I don't know if you guys looked at uh, you know, the ingredients on a package that says natural. I mean, you could say anything is natural. I mean, you know, American spirits are made with natural tobacco. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anything is natural. And, you know, at some point, if you break down the idea of farm to table, everything ha makes that trick. Whether it, you know, arrives at your table in the form of a Cheeto or arrives at your table in the form of, you know, a venison steak. It's, it has, has some sort of 
roots back to a farm in some way, even if it's theoretical. So I'm not a huge fan of the whole um, farm to table terminology. The idea behind it, I, you know, I'm a huge proponent of. And it's this idea of being able to be accountable and tracing our food back to its source and also patronizing that source, you know, giving, you know, money and support to those sources. And a lot of people do that through CSAs, which is short for Community Supported Agriculture, and it's a way of putting money directly into a farm as an investment and getting back a share of that farm, um, either each week or throughout the season. And um, that's a good way to do it. What was the other? I'm sorry. What was um, oh, agritourism. Agritourism, yeah. I mean, these are all, you know, agritourism, the idea is that people want to come to, say, this region or an agricultural region, a similar agricultural region, and have that sort of farm experience, whether you're just like setting foot on a farm for a few hours and seeing a working farm, or some people um, offer farm stays where you can go and like live on a farm for a weekend and, um, and sort of have a glamorous farm experience. Mm -hmm. There's a place, uh, I think up in Sullivan County, that is really, really nice, but it's, I wouldn't say it's exactly like living on a farm. Most farms that I've been on, really working farms, it, there's nothing very glamorous about it. Um, but I, you know, I can't argue with agritourism because I think if for nothing else, it's evolving the conversation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people are interested enough to want to take a trip two hours or three hours and get their boots muddy and see how a farm works is, is great. Um, Can you, do you know if these things are becoming more significant in terms of say farms starting to orient their operations around them? So like agritourism, I mean if you yeah. go pick pumpkins uh, in October, you know, you can go to some farms where you'll see buses pull up and there's, you know, out of towners who are just, you know, they're picking the pumpkins, they're taking the hay rides, they're mm -hmm. going to the, the little market in the barn, you know, and it's quite an operation. Yeah. Um, uh, what can you say about at least just how these two things are, you know, starting to transform agriculture? It's in the farm area. to table and agritourism? Yeah. Or, you know, well, I mean, I think with agritourism, I think it, it has become a really sort of viable way to extract dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think there are, I've talked to some farmers and landowners that are, have had really great experiences with it and they're able to market things directly and um, get people, you know, using social media or whatever channels they decide to use and getting people onto their farm and giving people the, a sort of tailored experience. Um, and then other farmers are just like, I don't have time. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's interesting because another component of that, which we haven't talked about, is the farmer's market system, um, which in a way is, you know, the lazy man's agritourism because it's like, <laughs> you know, it's bringing the farm to you. You know, if you've ever been to the, you know, what was really the sort of penultimate farmer's market, which is the um, Union Square Green Market in Union Square, Manhattan. Um, you know, the idea is that you're bringing this experience to the people and that people are supporting their farmers and having a relationship with them. Um, there's a lot to be said about that. I'm not going to hijack this conversation about that. And, um, but, and the farmer's market system in general has been hugely successful. But the reason why I bring it up is because I've talked to a lot of farmers that are like, I'm not going to do it. It's a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to I have to load up my truck or load up my van at four in the morning and drive down in Union Square and sit and, and answer dumb questions about squash for you know five hours. I'm not saying all farmers are like this, but I've definitely talked to farmers that are like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to me. I mean, the best thing, I from what I've what I've deduced from conversations. For a farmer is if a farmer can grow what they want to grow and sell it directly wholesale to a restaurant or a distributor. That's the easiest thing. That's like there's this one guy, Paisley Farm, that's up 
um, like Red Hook Tivoli area. And he sells, he does half of his product goes, maybe less than half, like 40% goes to CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, and the rest he just sells directly to restaurants in Manhattan. And he's like, this is the best thing in the world. Because, I mean, I'm sure there are farmers that like going to farmers markets, but it's a big effort and it's not a lot of return. So, um, and as far as farm to table, I don't know. Um, but you raise a larger point in terms of, um, you know, here we might now start talking directly about what local farms are starting to do to evolve and, you know, possibly even thrive. I mean, I think mm -hmm. we can maybe talk about that in this, this area. Um, Austin, did you want to say something? Um, I think the thing in our generation is like using Instagram, and Instagram, yeah. like everyone takes pictures of their food. Like just because it, they just like, like how it looks on the table, and they just take a pretty picture and they share it with everyone. And I think we, um, people could do that with local sustainable farms. Like take a picture of a food from something that was just kind of advertised that way. Like this is like organic and from a sustainable farm, and like you guys should try it out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, I mean, I know a lot of people that, that do that and they really exploit Instagram for that. Yeah. I mean, the, I guess the question would be, to what effect and impact is that? I mean, is yeah. it just like, are you just looking at pretty pictures of food and yeah. whatever it may be? Um, mm -hmm. Or is it is it provocative enough that, you know, people are talking about it? I mean, yeah. you guys, it's interesting, you guys just went to Sprout Creek, right? And so they're they're kidding now, right? They're they're having all the baby goats. So Sprout Creek functions as I mean I know they have they have cattle and they have goats, right? And they have chickens. And they have chickens. Um, and so they use the goat milk to make goat cheese. And um, so okay, I don't know if you guys had this conversation. So goats tend to have. A, I forgot how often they breed, but they tend to have twins. And, and goat milk comes from the female goats, so what happens to the male goats? They go to the slaughter. Yeah. yeah. Well, they don't necessarily eat them there, but this is kind of one of those things that people don't really talk about, is that the male goats are immediately separated from their parents, and they're just sent off to slaughter. For pet food. Well, it's Sprout Creek Farm. Farm. They keep them for two years and let them live, and then they send them off that's, to the slaughter. That's right. I think yes. I had that conversation with them. Yeah. Um, more, a, a larger operation that's local is Coach Farms, which maybe you guys have heard of. Yeah, um, heard of what? Coach, Coach, Coach. Farm. Yeah, Coach Farms. Do you guys know about Coach Bags? Um, it, it's it's probably not what you're thinking. It's um, Coach is like this very sort of luxury brand. Yeah. And um, so it was started by the people that started Coach Bags, and they're, they're now a very aged couple. I think actually one of them died. And then they started Coach Farms, and they're up in eastern Dutchess County. And Coach Farms really started this whole idea of, like, they sort of popularized goat cheese. And so they're up in eastern Dutchess County, and I went to go visit them around this time of year. And all the goats were kidding. And, which means that they were giving birth to babies. And, you know, ha at least half of the babies I saw were boys. And I said, well, what do you do with them? And they're like, they get shipped off immediately and they get turned into pet food. Um, and it's interesting because there are local movements now. Um, there's one that's called No Goat Left Behind. To um, th There's a lot of incentive there to make goat more of a an acceptable thing to eat because people in in American culture don't eat a lot of goat. Jamaicans eat a lot of goat. Um, Mexicans, eat Latin, Latin Me American yeah, Latinos, eat um, certain Muslim cultures eat goat, African cultures, but in in American culture, not so much. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to um, both make goat something that, that people will want to eat, and they're doing this by um, going through chefs who are the tastemakers to sort of start putting goat on the menu and getting people excited about it and seeing the versatility of it. And also goat is a far more sustainable form of livestock to raise than cow. 
cattle are very, very difficult and labor intensive and they drink more water than you can possibly imagine. And so um, goat is a more sustainable alternative. Yes. Um, and the Culinary Institute is here as well. So I feel like they could be something where they're um, making dishes using goat. Like yeah. Some kind because of, a lot of the chefs go on to like work in restaurants in the Hudson Valley, and I feel like collaborating with them would be a good idea. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if I don't know if these uh, organizations have really reached out to the Culinary Institute. Um, yeah. Um, the Culinary Institute has has really evolved in the in the eight years or so that I've been here. Um, there wasn't as much of a conversation about local food and that sort of identity. Um, when I first got here, and now there really is. And I was just there on Monday, and they partnered with uh, American Farmland Trust to do a screening, and they had like the Beatman boys there, and they were they're really endeavoring to make it more of a conversation. So they, they seem like a, a really useful barometer for the change in that I think what connections they are making to area farms. They're not doing it necessarily out of Hudson Valley pride. Their concern is they want to turn out you know, the top restaurateurs and chefs, and they know that the markets, you know, in general for those things, involve now new interest in local food or even yeah. farm to table. So, you know, they, I think there's a interest probably now. But, but they have to get up to speed on that. It also benefits them that they elevate the area mm -hmm. as like the Hudson Valley being this sort of food destination yeah. and having a culture. And it's, it's, you know, no coincidence that the other principal uh, culinary institute campus is in the Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's a, a sort of corollary there. So let's talk then, you know, um, about the ways that local farms now are starting to, you know, innovate. Um, and we've discussed, uh, obviously, you know, whether farm table or agritourism, uh, farmers markets, relationships with restaurants. Um, and I mean, I think before we go much further, it seems like one of the big issues here in terms of, I think this is even implicit when you're talking about social media, is the market for these farms, literally like the consumer base. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, this region is not so populated that it alone could sustain all of these farms, and particularly when you're selling premium, you know, organic or local, you know, grass-fed uh, meat or you know, organic agriculture. It's not clear that this region could sustain it. But the the gorilla in the closet is New York City. Sure, and we are living near first the largest city and you know one of the hugest metropolitan areas and Westchester is as close as it gets and it's not that not all that far from here um, and certainly you know the interest in food you know the food the so-called foodie culture mm -hmm. now I mean that is a, a center for it the Union Square farmers market <coughs> is huge uh, and you know there's a number of farmers markets that could you know turn over volume many times more than even the most popular farmers markets in this area. You know? Yeah. So when we're talking about how farms are starting to evolve and you know thrive, um, it seems like that has to be addressed. Uh, the the sort of influence. Yeah, the, the influence, and the yeah. economic influence, the consumer influence, the cultural influence. When we're talking about agritourism. I don't think there's a lot of overseas travel here, or even cross-country travel. We're talking day trips from New York City. Well, no, I mean, I think there's, there are some, there's definitely people that okay. are coming from, from their field. I mean, I would say more people are coming up from New Jersey or New York City or the New York City metropolitan area. But, um, I mean, the Hudson Valley has become much more of a destination, and then there are people that come through here from the West Coast, or from the Midwest, or even sometimes overseas, um, you would you kind of be surprised. I'm often surprised, but I think, you know, as I mentioned before, the sort of financial incentive of doing a farmers market. Um, I think for a lot of producers in the area, it it doesn't make as much sense to sell what they're what they're cultivating locally here locally when they could get so much more money in the city. 
Um, like for instance, there's uh, these people I know that live up in Chatham, and they have what could be deemed as a pretty successful operation. It's a small farm, but they do um, they raise they raise pigs and they raise I'm trying to remember if they raise goats. I don't think they raise goats. And they have like a charcuterie operation, um, and they raise chickens and. They have, you know, farm-raised eggs, and they sell them in the farmers' markets around here for five or six dollars a dozen. Um, and she was telling me that they sell them to like Brooklyn Larder and a few other places in Brooklyn, and they go for nine dollars and forty-five cents a dozen. And so they sell them wholesale to these these organizations, and they get they wind up recouping six dollars and fifty cents for each dozen. So it's like figured out, you know, like going to the farmer's market and trying to sell eggs in Chatham or just unloading all of your eggs to Brooklyn and getting fifty cents more per dozen and having them being sold as this premium product that has your name on it and that like basically sort of brands you as something highly desirable. So As you say, you don't just sell them, you know, with the, the food interest and the foodie culture there. You get to brand your farm and that becomes its own kind of asset. Yeah. As you start moving possibly into new products or doing new things, that name follows and it has a, it has a market, it has a, a following. Yeah, and, and I think that New York City over the last five to seven years, has really developed a sort of language as far as the menus and the restaurants. Um, this idea of elevating the local food and, and finding that sort of farm to table aspect. And um, I mean, it's interesting. I remember going to, Michael White is a very celebrated chef and he has a place called Maria, or Ma Maria, Maria, I don't know how you pronounce it. But it basically means sea and it's right on uh, Central Park South. And I went there and it was a crazy expensive meal, which was quite good. But the whole thing, the chef was coming out and he was saying, this such and such kind of fish was fetched from the Sea of Sardinia this morning. And now you have it. And it was such like an interesting, absurd, and like he kept, uh, this is from, you know, what I forgot, there was some agency that this other fish was from. And that was really kind of the norm of dining like 20 years ago, is that you would go to a restaurant and they would be like, caviar from the Baltic, you know, this from here. And that was the representation of fine dining is that everything was from really far away. And now the conversation has really gotten smaller and it's like things are from Chatham or Poughkeepsie or New Paltz or Garrison or Westchester or whatever. Uh, I think a big part of that is like educating the people and letting them know that buying from disabled farms is better overall for just like society and humanity. Yeah. And um, like the farmer's market is really big at Vassar, like at, yeah. it's every um, Tuesday or Thursday. Thursday, I think. Thursday right. okay. And like we all like because we all know that it's good to buy from sustainable farms, and it's like because we're so like because we know that it's like we're not gonna buy from like cheap stores that you know. So I think educating the people is important in this. Yeah. Know, somehow. I don't think. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right, and I think that's the thing that has been vexing in a larger conversation to America is because food has gotten so crazy cheap in a lot of ways. Um, you know, like you guys could go out now and probably eat somewhere in Poughkeepsie and eat some sort of substandard something and it will be like three dollars and cents a cents. And, but you know, you don't know where that food came from and it's not necessarily that good for you and it doesn't really benefit the local economy other than the owner of whatever franchise it is. And you know, it's this idea that I think people struggle with is that there are absolute repercussions to how we spend our money and how we eat and um, I mean it's interesting I kind of when I'm in these situations I sometimes ask people how much money they spend on food and I don't know I find that most people don't know how much money yeah. they spend on food. Meal swipe. <laughs> yeah in meal <laughs> swipe or whatever it is I mean you know I think most people if you stop them on the street like how much money do you spend on food a year? They can probably tell you how much money they spend on their credit card or their phone bill or their internet or whatever it may be. But, you know.
you know, we spend a crazy amount of money on food, and it's really one of the ways in which we could assert our sort of beliefs and our politics, and um, and it can't be understated how much it, it really impacts our environment, whether it's our global or local environment, because as I said earlier, two farms disappear from New York State each week, and so it's not like they just disappear and go up to the clouds and then it's just fallow farmland. They disappear because somebody's developing that land. They're pouring concrete over it. And that's land that will never be farmed again. And that is land that no longer absorbs rainwater. It's land that could have been farmed sustainably and could have kept the purity of the neighboring uh, streams or the runoff you know, intact, but now it's concrete, and now, or now it's some other endeavor, now it's um, a giant stop and shop with like some sort of, you know, one stop medical something or other, and it's creating pollution, or it's creating traffic, and I mean, it, it impacts everything, it's profound how much of, it, of an impact it has, so it's huge, sorry, I digress. What else as we go out in this course and visit some of these places? I mean, in terms of sustaining local agriculture, um, what are the, you know, uh, developments or, uh, you know, uh, causes or, you know, just maybe it's particular um, kinds of m interest in certain kinds of food or ways of eating? What should we be on the lookout for? What, is this, what does this area do particularly well? Uh, and, and, you know, in an innovative way. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's been a big movement, and you guys will probably see this when you go to Farm to, um, Farm Co-Packers, I always forget what their name is. Farm to Table Farm to Table Co-Packers. Is there's this idea of bringing added value. Because it's one thing to be growing, you know, eight tons of squash per year on your farm and hoping that people want to buy, you know, squash from you, but it's another thing to actually add value. And, and I should probably define what added value means, which is when you take a product, say squash, and you you either process it or, or make it in such a way in that, you know, you either freeze it so people could enjoy it all year round, or you make a sauce from the squash, or you, you freeze dry it and make it into chips or something. And you're basically creating value for something that would have otherwise sold by the pound. And farm to, value, farm to table co-packers, they do a lot of that. And they do interesting work with farmers where farmers will come in and say, I've got like more sour cherries than I could possibly sell. I have no clue what to do with them. They're going to be rotting in my cooler unless I do something with them. And they will say, well, let's think about what we could do. Here are some ideas. Here's what you could actually do. Here's a recipe you could do. You, you know, I mean, I remember one of the things that um, Jim was telling me was this idea that someone um, came with garlic scapes. Do you guys know what garlic scapes are? They're, it's okay. I didn't really know what they were. I, it just sounds familiar. It's basically when the garlic plant grows, it gets this, it's, they're actually incredibly beautiful. They're like these little tendrils like things and they come up into a point and they're green they almost look like asparagus and they're incredibly flavorful but it's kind of it's something you kind of see at farmers markets but you're not going to find them at stop and shop or adams or someplace like that and so he was like i've got all these garlic scapes and i'm just putting in my compost what did i do with them and so they came up with this idea of making pesto and then they made you know however many zillions of pounds of pesto and then they started selling it. They started freezing it and selling it. And that would have been something, that's something that's obviously adding value to their crop. It's something that would have otherwise gone by the wayside. Another thing that I, I want to mention as far as movements, I mean, there's so many, but I, I, would, I would be, um, I'd fail if I didn't mention um, Glenwood Center, which is down in Cold Spring, has, um, a cider project that they've been working on for the last three or so years. And the idea is that, um, getting back to this idea of like what is a regional cuisine for the Hudson Valley, hard cider, which is the alcoholic version of apple cider, was what everyone was drinking here. 
you know, some 200, 250 years ago. And that was because apples were plentiful and it was safe because water wasn't always, this, like potable water was hard to come by. So people were drinking hard cider. And then, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, that really sort of fell off for a lot of different reasons. And people stopped making hard cider. So Glenwood Center, which is in Cold Spring, started working with apple growers to sort of revive this, this sort of hard cider making endeavor. And one of the things that they did, which was a, a, a kind of amazing project that I covered, was they brought cider producers from France over to the Hudson Valley to sort of work with Hudson Valley apple growers on, on figuring out how to really effectively and deliciously and sustainably um, create a cider crop and how to market it. And then the Hudson Valley apple growers went to France and went and saw firsthand how to do it. And it was called the Cider Exchange. And it's been going on, the exchange hasn't been going on each year, but I think it's going to happen again. But they've been having this cider project that has really elevated this idea of hard cider. And it's given people that grow apples that, that are really not that appealing, because these are apples that are maybe too bitter, or they don't look good on, on a supermarket shelf and given them a sort of second life, and also given this product that was sort of lost in history uh, another uh, boost. And I'm sure if you guys go out now, most bars, from what I can tell, have some sort of hard cider on the menu, which four years ago, that was non-existent. So then there's a bazillion others, but I you know we don't have that much time. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I was just looking at your article on Honey, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, um, I mean, there are always like new movements and new fresh movements. Uh, a few months ago, coconut water was like all the rage, yeah. and now coconut oil is like a huge thing. Um, I'm just wondering how that kind of, how those kind of play, you just talk about cider and how it's becoming more popular, but how that kind of plays into Hudson Valley, like obviously coconut oil, not so much because yeah, there's no local coconuts. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> but you know, honey, you know, you were talking in the yeah. article about how honey is now a really big deal. Um, and how do you identify those new up and coming trends and how do you cover them in that Hmm. Well, how do I identify it? I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I write for other magazines. This is not my only thing that I do. And um, as I said, you know, I've, I've written for Bon Appetit, I've written for Food and Wine, and Playboy magazine, and New York Times. And those outlets, I tend to more cover trends. I tend to focus on it because that's kind of what moves magazines. And I kind of feel like this is my, I don't know, this is my outlet to not focus on trends as much. That's not to say that I, I haven't looked into it. And especially, I mean, you got to figure if something is a trend, it's either because there's some inherent novelty in it that is appealing to people, or that there's some real importance to it. So there have been trends that I've covered for this magazine. Um, charcuterie being one of them. Um, I'm trying to think of other things. Um, I, I'm just drawing a blank. But I, I try not to focus as much on like trends in the Hudson Valley unless it really says something specific. Um, you know, I mean, microbrewing is a big one for the area. Hard cider, as I mentioned. Um, I mean, it's interesting because I think one area in which this area has really had a difficult time that not a lot of people want to talk about is its wine growing. Yeah. Um, and there's a huge movement among wine producers, and there's tons of wineries and vineyards in the area. But there's a huge movement to really sort of bolster this idea of like a Hudson Valley wine. But, you know, the sort of chatter amongst people that are in the know is that like it doesn't really have an identity. You know, there's not really like, if you go to the Napa Valley, there's like a real sense of like Napa Valley wine and this whole idea of terroir, if you guys are familiar with that term. And Hudson Valley doesn't have that so much as far as wine. It's kind of all over the place. There's no real like Hudson Valley and part of it is that we don't have, I mean, there is a tradition, but not a great tradition for growing wine in the area, but we don't, it, we have such a short growing season. I mean, it's 
crazy short as opposed to, you know, places, you know, in the Mediterranean or in California where they have much longer growing seasons. So the wine industry is struggled. <clears throat> I'll, I'll be diplomatic, I'll say it's struggled. But um, in, it, that would be interesting to see if it becomes something trendy. And it's hard, I haven't seen it happen yet. I think um, it's possible to make things trendy. So maybe through like, like I said, just through the internet and through social media, obviously, and through just, um, through just like advertising it, you know? And like, because like through advertising, just people, I don't know, I feel like people would want to buy these things and it will become trendy. Yeah. I'm not sure, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. I kind of have a problem with the word trend just because I feel like trends come and go so quickly and this is something that you're not, you don't want to see it go and something that goes along with the education of people and you are saying earlier like it's important to educate them so they know why you should be eating from local farms and everything. Um, I think it goes beyond that because a lot of people are like, oh I'm eating organic. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah, well, name two farms. <laughs> like it's, it, it needs to be something that they're actually being educated about where it's coming from and why those people are doing what they're doing so that it stays around longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, going back to the wine thing that you were talking about, yeah. I, I was going through your magazine and I noticed a lot of the wine, uh, the ads, have like wine trails and experience yeah. wine events. So something you're talking about, agro-tourism. Yeah. Do you think uh, that's yeah. something that will help them? Is that like... Yeah, definitely. Trail? And thank you for mentioning that. I, I failed to mention that. But yeah, there's there's a lot of sort of wine trail tourism. Um, it's more, a little more focused on the, like, Ulster County in that area because there's more wineries over there. But I think that has helped them a lot. But, you know, it has brought a lot of people to the region and they're excited about it. But I, I feel... And I know I can't say that this is off the record, but I feel that so much of it is because people want it to be like a Napa Valley. People want it to feel like the Hudson Valley is like Napa, and you, know, you could go here and have that wine experience. But I don't. I, I guess it's just interesting because, like Vassar, our senior week, we usually do a wine tour. Mm -hmm. Okay. We actually replaced it this year with a beer brew tour, like a brewery tour. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just like one of those, like you, like you said, my brewery is totally taking off in the area. There yeah. Are lots of different like breweries, and that's awesome. But yeah, it and just kind of shows the progression. Yeah. And I, I also, I, I know that I'm probably going over time here, but I, one thing to really note, and I know that you kind of made passing mention to this in regards to growing grain is that there's been a huge, crazy boom as far as, um, and this is something also that speaks to trends, as far as distilleries. Um, in 2006, New York State passed the Farm Distil Distillery um, Law, which enabled people to distill uh, you know, in the, on their own farms and use local grain. And that's completely blown up and, and, and it's been this sort of fountain of, of creativity and, and amazing products have come out of this area. Amazing distilleries with really interesting products from the low end to the high end. I mean, there's Hill Rock Distillery, which is that I visited um, a few months back and they're in, over by Pine Plains where you guys are going to go next week, I guess. And they are growing their own grain, they're malting their own grain, and they're distilling everything. And they have a distiller from uh, Maker's Mark Distillery up from the south that's helping them create like this really premium product that you know comes in these bottles. I think like these 750 milliliter bottles. That's like 145 dollars a bottle, which you know that obviously is marketed towards a certain subset of society that could afford to do that, but it's pretty amazing that that's there now when nothing was there before. It was a fallow farm. So the sort of grain to product aspect is incredibly trendy now, but also has value because they're, they're creating something that's really kind of interesting and it's furthering the conversation about the, about spirits and hard liquor and, and you know, it, it, it's sort of changing and I can't really articulate it right now, but it's, 
it's interesting to, to watch and to witness. But, um, okay, and is there any other questions? Otherwise, uh, help me thank Eric Steiner.